I'm Jennifer Byrne and welcome to the club. We have two books dripping with angst and urban alienation tonight, laced with humour and alcohol to soften the mix. The first is Indelible Ink by Fiona McGregor, a book which has had the critics all a Twitter and which we were keen to have a good look at for ourselves. And our classic tonight, well, why don't you see if you can guess. It's a book about a teenager. It's one of the most famous titles of modern times. The author, a very mysterious solitary guy, died earlier this year. It's never been out of print and when first published in 1951, this is what they said. Once in a blue moon, there appears on the American literary scene a young voice so articulate, so understanding, so full of humour, love and pity that jaded book reviewers must stop dead in their tracks and rejoice. That's what we're talking about on the show very shortly, but let's get started. Introducing, as ever, my friends Marie Hardy and Jason Steger. Now, our first guest tonight is a repeat offender, this being his second <laughs> time in the club. We all know him as a playwright, an actor, a screenwriter, but next month, the busiest bloke in the country sees the release of his first novel, How It Feels. Please welcome back Brendan Carl. guest is an award-winning journalist and presenter who went on to serve for more than seven years as a Victorian government minister and this year released her first book, the moving and revealing memoir, Public Life, Private Grief. Please welcome her to the club, Mary Della Hunty. Okay, Brendan. This book that made yes. the critics rejoice. Yes, so look, it's quite, it's quite arrogant to choose this book because there's been so much said about it, but I think it's important just to look at it as a book, really. Uh, I, um, I've, I've read this book a few... I re first read this book at university when I was 20 years old and it, it absolutely was the life-changing book. Uh, I just, it just opened my mind up to, you know, a way of looking at the world and, and his character. And I think, interestingly enough, since, since Catcher in the Rye, that style of character, the angsty kid against the world who can't find his place, has become very familiar. But I think at that time it was a relatively new character in, in a lot of ways. And, um, I guess after reading that book uh, in 1996, uh, I, you know, Holden Caulfield talks about characters that are phony. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in most of the people he meets. That he calls them phony, and he goes on to or explain, crummy. or crummy, or phony. Mm -hmm. And oh, the thing I loved most about it when I was writing my book, while I studied it, was because I just loved the first-person narrative. He talks direct to the reader about his experiences and often says, you know, I just, I wish you were there. You know, you wouldn't have believed it. It was, it was unbelievable. Mm. I wish you were there. And he kind of just involves you in his experience. So when it does become quite dark or he becomes quite, quite bleak or cynical against humanity, you're kind of, you're kind of with him because of the way he's addressing you. And we'll come back, but, we'll come back. Because you, I know you could go on for the next 15 minutes. I just want to make one more point. After, <laughs> after, after reading about all this phoniness, um, after that day, pretty much all the work I have made or all the behaviours in my life, I've wondered whether Holden Caulfield would think I'm phony. You know, I have kind of lived by that rule so of thinking... A, he's on he's, your shoulder He's on my shoulder. That's why it changed my life, because I've okay. always thought, well, I'm about to do this. I wonder, if, wonder what Holden Caulfield would think, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so let, Let's talk a bit more about... It's probably a psychological disorder for that. <laughs> Caulfieldism. Um, <laughs> let's talk about old Holden, as he calls it when he likes old Phoebe, old yeah, Holden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about Holden Caulfield. Uh, well, I, I mean, I still fall in love with men like Holden Caulfield, that, you know, he's just this eccentric, self-absorbed, you know, misanthropic, uh, questioning the world. I mean, I, I love his voice. I, you know, loved him as a teenager and you know, I'm a little bit old for him now. I'm just sort of jailbait now. But, um, <laughs> he, but it's, you know, it I read... be your Joyce Maynard. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, yeah, I read it a lot when I was a teenager and again in my early 20s and probably haven't picked it up uh, since then. It's, Did you still love him? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's pretty, it's word perfect, I think. But uh, a lot more of the sadness came through than I'd ever, you know, I really felt my heart broke for him mm. a lot more than it ever had. I haven't read it for a very long time and I tired a little bit of his voice, actually. And because because the style is so sort of strong and the language, you know, he, he goes over using all those terms, you know, I mean, what does he say? Um, phony, old, goddamn, you know, da, 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 and all. It killed and me. I've got to tell you, this yeah. really, really is and like gorgeous. If, if, if you want to know the truth, 
You, you know, that's, you want to know the if truth. you want to know the truth, that's the sort of key, isn't it? And if you want to know the truth, we're getting it from Holden. We're getting Holden's truth. I, I found the style eventually sort of started to grate a little bit with me. And me I got tired. I got a bit tired of it. You're but, both no, no, wrong. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Doesn't mean it's not a great I'm, book. It's just. It's just. It wears you down no, after see, a I while. I think the mark of that sort of writing is that you instantly want to write and talk like that. <gasps> That's you leave fact. that book wanting to write. Yeah. You know what yeah. I do? I went back and read the crits of the time, and it was astonishing how many of them thinking they were original until it all came out, mm. that all of them wrote in this style. Immediately they picked it up and everyone yeah. was writing the it's reviews. It's absolutely intoxicating. In this, this, yeah. this kind of hipster, ultra-honest, but sort of, yeah, personal, intimate. I mean, it, because the first time you read it, it does have that sort of huge impact, doesn't it? And I think inevitably, when you read it again, it doesn't, um, unfortunately. Mm. And I, I mean, I... As I say, I, I sort of tired of the style, but that doesn't mean I don't I don't admire the book. But you got sick of Walt Holden, you said. You got sick I of got him. a little bit sick of him, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I first met Holden, uh, you know, when I was studying the canon, and so you came out of Shakespeare and Dickens and the though and thou, and suddenly you ran into goddamn all, <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it because suddenly there was this sense of stream of consciousness. Rereading it. I now think of Steve Toltz, actually, and I think of how much it changed literature. But I also see the poignancy in it, you know, and I now understand what Catcher in the Rye was about. I simply didn't understand it when I first read it. What was the metaphor about Catcher in the Rye? Mm. And here's this, you know, 16, 17-year-old kid, so full of pain and, and not able to find someone who can actually love him. Uh, that he wants to love all these other, you know, lost mm. kids. And that little sequence where he talks about, I want to look after all these kids in the rye. Mm. Stop them falling over I the want cliff. to stop them falling over the cliff. Mm. Now, I missed that completely yeah. when I read it, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's the mark of a classic, isn't it, that you can return to a book and, and yes, say, OK, that style now is, is a bit old hat and it's a bit uh, well used and it can be effective, but there is something much deeper. Also, I, I thought you think not much is happening, you know, because basically he has a bad time at Pensy Prep and then he has two days wandering around, you know, mm, yeah. New York. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that style you're talking about, where it was so direct, it doesn't come across as like flashbacks as it would in a third person. Yeah. It's just him chatting to you. Yeah. Well, this reminds me of when... He tells like, you a story about when he saw a movie and, mm, you know, yeah. and what the actors were like and... Or, 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 or why, you know. how, when he goes to the Natural History Museum and, yeah. and what he loves is that, that the Eskimo is still there catching the fish and the <laughs> deer is still there and at the lake. And you change, that that never changes, you change. And you yeah. feel that yeah. yearning. I want to be safe, I want to be yes. secure, yeah. I want things yes. not to... Slip Absolutely. I, I found, you know, we were talking about it, how it can be abrasive, the voice, and I, I found a new tenderness in the book. I mean, that lovely conversation he, he keeps wanting to have with people he has with the cab mm. driver of, does anyone know where the ducks yeah. go in winter mm. when the lake freezes over? And he keeps just asking yeah. random people. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, whether it's an intentional metaphor or not, he is in a cold world and he yeah. is trying to find somewhere to go. But it was a beautiful conversation. And <laughs> if anything, that's all he was trying to do is try to, he's trying to connect with people. And look, he, he's a wild and, and, and kind of acute observer, almost painfully and almost to his own demise because he pushes people away. But... There's, there's tenderness in observation. Mm. And I think with his wisdom and his genius, it, it's kind of crippled him. He can't really be in the world, which mm. inevitably Salinger couldn't be in the world yeah. after the book yeah. became so big. And the truth is he continued to write every day. And there yeah. are yeah. many unpublished manuscripts, but he, he just didn't like the publishing business. He, he didn't like what happened to his family and friends, not mm. only the critics. And, and mm. the, most, the thing he hated the most was how people could criticise your characters. He didn't mind saying well, it was a good like book or not. Like we've just done with, with Fiona. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just like that. He said, how dare you murder my, they're my characters? Yeah. And he hated that and he said p publishing was the worst business. He'd rather spend two hours at the dentist than a minute, you know, in the publishing business. So where are all these scripts? That's what I'm excited well, he's about. Gonna and who's going to have copyright of them? And who's well, going to fight over them? Is it going to be like Kafka, yeah. you know, over there in Berlin? And, uh, and of course, Israel wants all his old manuscripts. Who's going to fight over Salinger's? We haven't even seen Anyone them. with the remotest chance of getting them, I suspect. I, I, I would could be, be very sure he, he burnt them all. I mean, he has so much... Why would he you write, think he, he wrote to write. He wrote, wrote to write by yeah. the end. Yeah. Yeah. But he never... I mean, in the, in the, 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 
I read one interview that he gave in the 70s or something, and he, he, didn't, he said he didn't know whether they would be published posthumously. In a way, you'd yes. have sort of hoped that... Mm. You'd hope that he stuck to his I mean, guns did, and burned the whole book. He did write I Mean Zooey. And, I mean, there mm. were other books. It was just no, this really one reason. totally overshadowed. And that's the club for another month. A big thanks to tonight's book clubbers. Thank you so much, Brendan, Marie, Jason and Mary. Thank you. Now, next month, well, I know we said that we'd do it in summer or early next year, but we just can't wait a minute longer to look at the book everyone's talking about, Jonathan Franzen's Freedom. So that will be on our agenda. Plus, my choice for the club, <laughs> At the Shrugged by Anne Rand. It's a monster. It's contentious. It has formed a whole stream of social and economic philosophy and it's back on top of the bestseller lists in America after 50 years um, since it was published, largely thanks to the Tea Party movement. Anyway, it's also worth having a look at before it gets ruined by Hollywood because there is a film on the way. So there you go. Two big, fat books. Look happy, you guys. <laughs> I hope you'll have a go at least some of them. Um, and until next month, very happy reading. Good night.